A under the, the heading, the rubric of um, the Council of Europe at a crossroads, which is part of the uh, IIEA's Global Europe project supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin. So we're joined today by a panel consisting of uh, Bjorn Berger here to my right, um, the Deputy Secretary General of the Council of Europe, um, Senator Fiona O'Loughlin from uh, the Irish delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly will be with us um, shortly, and Professor Aoife Nolan um, from the University of Nottingham. I will introduce our three panelists uh, in a moment. Um, before um, turning to the panel and that discussion under that heading, I'd like to call on um, Ragnar Armquist, who is the director in the Department of Foreign Affairs of the Council of Europe section. And he's going to say a few words on the occasion, uh, the happy occasion perhaps for him and for the team of the coming uh, termination of the Irish chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers which occurs in uh, three or four days' time. Right now, the, the floor is yours for a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Termination is probably not the term we'd use, more of a, of a happy of a happy handover to our Icelandic friends, but uh, appreciate it very much. Well, Deputy Secretary-General Barry, uh, Senator Olaf won't be here in a moment, as you said, uh, and Professor Nolan. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here at the IAEA in person and amongst uh, many good friends. I know that Tony Connolly uh, was here uh, a little earlier this afternoon, and no doubt will have been speaking uh, about the UK and its special relationships. Um, but our department is privileged to enjoy many special relationships too. Uh, and one of them is with the IAEA uh, and reflected in the fact that so many brilliant colleagues like Peter, Barry and others here, uh, Colin indeed, uh, offer their expertise in Europe House um, and in so doing, continue to make, I know, very valuable contributions to Irish foreign policy. It's also reflected in the fact that um, uh, a number of young diplomats who joined our department's uh, first gained experience uh, here on Georgia Street. And that includes uh, Stephen Frain, my own colleague who organized today's event. And just to say thanks to Stephen, who's been very hardworking over the last six months uh, on our Council of Europe Presidency team. And um, Peter, I know you, you led our permanent representation to the Council between 2011 uh, and 2016, which was a period uh, in which Strasbourg faced very exceptional challenges and took exceptional decisions, uh, not least in suspending Russia from the Parliamentary Assembly in the wake of the invasion of Crimea. Uh, but the circumstances confronting the Council of Europe today uh, are, are of a different order of magnitude. Uh, following the invasion of Ukraine in February and Russia's expulsion from the organization in March, uh, the Council, uh, as the title of this event suggests, uh, stands at something of a crossroads. And I think uh, never genuinely in our lifetimes have the threats to democracy, human rights and rule of law on this continent uh, been so pronounced. In our minister's words, um, never have we needed uh, what we've termed the conscience of Europe more. So as presidency of the Committee of Ministries these past six months, uh, Ireland has maintained that our response to the, the poly crises, uh, as we've heard them described, should be rooted in first principles, what we've called uh, founding freedoms. Um, and as we chart our path that we should take as our guiding compass, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights and the court which enforces it, and which as of this week uh, is led uh, by a very brilliant Irish justice, uh, Schaefer O'Leary. Um, in the here and now, as presidency, our first priority has been to ensure Strasbourg's expertise has been channeled as effectively as possible in support of Ukraine and her people. But looking to the longer term, we've also initiated uh, a number of strategic reflections, which we hope will lead to renewal, not just in Strasbourg, but uh, across our continent. Across our six-month presidency term, Ireland has convened over 60 conferences, seminars and events such as this in the last month alone. We've gathered justice ministers from across Europe to agree a new Dublin declaration on countering violence against women. We've established a new framework in Strasbourg to support Svetlana Tsainaskaya, a dear friend of Ireland too, and other advocates for democracy in Belarus. We've led the Committee of Ministers in urging a comprehensive international legal response to Russia's crime of aggression against Ukraine. And tomorrow in Dublin Castle, where Bjorn spoke very eloquently this morning, we'll sign another Dublin declaration, doubling down on Dublin, um, this time on global education, uh, a foundation for the democratic and civil renewal we've placed at the heart of our presidency. So we've done a lot, but much, much more is needed. Uh, and, and our view is that within the Council of Europe, much more is possible. Um, it's to that end that as chair of the Committee of Ministers, 
Simon Coveney has led calls for the heads of governments of the council's 46 member states to convene for what would be only the fourth time in the institution's 73 year history to reaffirm the importance of the rule of law, to recommit the human rights enshrined in our convention and to counter rising autocracy across the continent by reinvesting in democracy. And while we couldn't convene a summit in our presidency term, and I promise we tried, uh, I hope that very soon, uh, before our, our, our presidency term ends next week, we will secure agreement allowing one under the incoming Icelandic presidency, um, such that next year Reykjavik, which is home of the Althing, the world's oldest parliament, might see Europeans' rights reaffirmed and Europe's democracies reinvigorated. The substance of that summit has already been set through the work of Irish women. And if Maeve were here, she'd be asked saying, isn't, what isn't that true of? Um, between June and October, our president, former president, Mary Robinson, led an independent high-level reflection group uh, on the future of the Council of Europe. Well, Senator O'Loughlin uh, will soon complete a similar review on behalf of the Council's Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, and taken together, we believe those reports will present a blueprint for institutional renewal that's predicated above all upon political will because as President Robinson observed, and after seven or eight months working in the Council of Europe, this holds true for me, what the Committee of Ministers needs more than anything else is more ministers. Um, it's, it's, as Peter will attest, uh, very often uh, ministers' representatives who meet in Strasbourg. So as well as recommitting to founding freedoms, a summit presents an opportunity to advance new rights, a point which President Higgins underscored in his own recent address to the Parliamentary Assembly in Strasbourg. And that's one of many reasons I'm looking forward to hearing from Professor Ethan Nolan. Um, as Vice Chair of the European Committee on Social Rights, her leadership has helped put environmental rights very much on the Strasbourg map. And ahead of COP next week, we're all conscious how the rights we prioritize today will shape the future of our continent. Um, in closing, to reference that Ireland was a founding member of the Council of Europe and these past months we've been proud custodians of what it stands for. Peter, I know you joined the department in the year after Ireland joined the EU, so you know well the role, I won't say, uh, you're obviously five or six at that time, like, uh, know well the role a prodigy uh, the council membership played for our young state as a bridge from relative isolation to European integration. In important ways, the Treaty of London in 1949 marked a new chapter in Ireland's European story. Uh, and as we face into a new period of enlargement, it's time to consider what role the Council should now play in supporting Ukraine, Moldova and other states aspiring to EU membership. And also, I think, following the inaugural meeting of the new European political community in Prague last month to reflect on how the continent's original political community in Strasbourg can be renewed. So on these and other uncomplicated questions, I look forward to hearing the panel's reflections this evening. And thank you all for, for joining us. Peter, over to you. Um, just the housekeeping first. Um, we uh, will have our discussion with the panelists. After that, we will have a discussion both here and online. You can join us here, obviously, by raising your and uh, questions can be submitted online using the, uh, the Q&A facility there. And in fact, those who are online may submit their questions in the course of the, uh, in the, course of the discussion. We'll come to them as they, uh, as they accumulate. Um, you can also join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And uh, both our panel discussion and the, the Q&A will be on the record. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, our panelists, uh, Bjorn Berger knows the Council of Europe inside out. Um, he was uh, he was there when I served in in Strasbourg as the uh, chef de cabinet to the two term Secretary General from Norway, Tobin Yangland, and he subsequently uh, served as the Secretary to the Committee of Ministers. Currently, he's the Deputy Secretary General of uh, the Council since March 2021. And in that uh, remit, he's, he covers many of the areas of, of work of the, the COE very closely, including particularly um, advising on and advising on the implementation of the Secretary General's reform agenda, uh, the shaping of the program and budget, and generally ensuring that the organization's activities have maximum impact um, in advancing democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Um, Senator Fiona O'Loughlin from Kildare, a member, as the name implies, from uh, Shannad Aaron, 
deputy leader of Fianna Foil in that body. She's the chair of the Oireachtas Women's Caucus and of the All-Party Committee on Dementia. Sandra Lachlan, uh, for the purposes of today's discussion, is head of the Irish delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and currently rapporteur uh, for that body on the question of holding the fourth summit, which uh, Ragnar has uh, alluded to. And she's also, I should say, a vice president of the ALDI group um, in the Council of Europe framework. Professor Aoife Nolan is a professor of international human rights law and co-director of the Human Rights Law Center at the University of Nottingham. Her professional experience in human rights and constitutional law straddles the legal, policy, practitioner, and academic fields. She's vice president of the uh, Council of Europe's European Committee on Social Rights, looking after the social charter of the uh, Council of Europe. She has acted as an expert advisor to a range of international and national entities uh, working in the human rights issues, including the Council of Europe, a um, number of UN treaty bodies, a number of UN special procedures, and the World Bank. And she's an academic expert member at uh, the Doughty Street Chambers. So Ragnar has pretty much set the, uh, <clears throat> the general scene uh, for the discussion uh, with the panel um, as the Irish chairmanship, the very full Irish chairmanship um, with events both in or in Ireland, in, in Strasbourg, and, and indeed further afield coming to an end uh, within the coming week. Um, I think it's probably natural to take the um, report of the high-level group under the chairmanship of um, Mary Robinson as the uh, best starting point for the discussion on the Council of Europe uh, being at a crossroads. It's certainly the commissioning of the report may have been precipitated by the uh, invasion of uh, uh, Ukraine by Russia. But I think the need for such a look at the Council, its functioning, its place in European uh, political architecture and landscape was becoming clear um, even before that. <clears throat> and um, the report therefore is, is uh, was and is very timely. So Bjorn, um, you've worked with the Secretary General with the former Secretary General. The current Secretary General was the one who commissioned um, the report, Secretary General uh, Burich. So would you care to comment uh, firstly on the procedural handling from now going forward of the report, which is in the hands of the Secretary General? And secondly, on the feasibility, as you see it, of the carrying out of uh, the recommendations. I mean, there's a lot of focus on the summit, and I'd very much like to hear um, your, your views on the feasibility of that being carried through. But of course, there are, I think, 29 further recommendations from the, um, the high-level group. So the carrying out of those uh, politically, financially, and organizationally, indeed, is something I'd be interested to hear your, your views on. Well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's great to be back in Dublin and to be here tonight uh, with you and uh, the great colleagues and panelists uh, over here and the old friend uh, chairing this discussion. Um, uh, when it comes to the process uh, in regard to the summit, um, and I think you alluded to it too, and also uh, Randa from the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, it's 17 years ago since we had the last summit. So it's, uh, it's really says something about uh, what is behind this uh, idea right now and this uh, proposal. And uh, if you uh, go back uh, and look at the history of the Council of Europe, I think there were three very much defining periods of the organization. The first, of course, after it was created in 1949, um, uh, and the second, after the Polish Civil War in 1989, where suddenly a number of European states were going to uh, change and, and become democracies uh, almost overnight. Uh, so that's why you also had two important summits 
in 93 and 97, uh, taking up new member states, altogether 16 new member states. I would propose that we are now in the third uh, defining uh, period of the organization. And that is because, for several reasons, uh, and it was referred to indirectly in the overview of the professor here. First, uh, because uh, the whole system we built up after the Second World War is really challenged now uh, with the institutions. Uh, uh, for us in the Council of Europe, the European Convention is questioning uh, why do we have the Council of Europe? Uh, some court cases has also generated quite a discussion among the European countries. In addition to that, we have the whole rise of populism, of course, which is part of it. Um, and um, uh, so these are, but the more immediate reason why we have this discussion now is, of course, the Russian invasion. Uh, that was really um, a shocking development, I think, uh, for, for the rest of Europe. Uh, Russia was 26 years a member in the organization, and the Council of Europe was the organization who expelled the country quite immediately after the 24th of February when the invasion took place. So uh, this warrants a certain uh, amount of reflection. What are the consequences now for Europe? What are the consequences for the Council of Europe? Or what we have experienced. I, I already explained some of the deeper underlying uh, uh, political um, elements of this, but, uh, but certainly the, uh, what we are seeing in Ukraine now and the war that is ongoing. Because this is going to have lasting impact on Europe and also, I believe, on international institutions like the Council. That's why we have this debate. That's why the idea is there. And that's why I think next week there will be a decision for us to hold the first summit in 17 years. Uh, probably next year, as Jordan said, in, in, in Iceland. And, uh, when it, and then, of course, you need also then to have a thorough reflection and then that can be the process. And that's why we have asked um, a panel of prominent European politicians, headed, of course, by Mary Roberts from Ireland, but also with the uh, Mogherini, the Vice President of the EU Commission, all the prominent politicians. Because we want also this external input, so to say, this external reflection. Uh, so this is the external reflection. This is the high-level reflection group. The report is already there. We refer to it, a number of recommendations. Then we also need to have an internal process. And that's where the OMAS and, and the Parliamentary Assembly's report will be so crucial. Uh, and uh, you have already um, uh, uh, written, uh, written a, a very interesting uh, memorandum, introductory uh, memorandum. Um, and, and this is part of the internal discussions. And now these will feed into discussions in the Committee of Ministers, where all the ambassadors are from all the 46 countries, both the external contribution and the internal from the Parliamentary Assembly. And this will then lead to discussions on, on certainly on the various recommendations. Uh, and then it, we will have to start to develop also uh, very concrete decisions for to be taken at the summit at the highest level uh, with the presidents and the prime ministers of our member states. And, and uh, of course, there will be a reference then to, and, and, and uh, it will be based on, on the very interesting ideas and proposals in the three reports. Um, and um, now, in terms of process, we are in the midst of this reflection in the committee of uh, These discussions uh, took place even today, and they are ongoing. And it's hard for me to say now where we'll end up, what sort of document, what sort of decisions we will end up with. But I think studying, I've been able to read both your memorandum and the high level reflection report. I think they overlap to a certain degree. Um, what I find very, very important, given the mandate of the Council of Europe, is the need to address the issue of the, the democracy, how we can strengthen and support the media more. You, you talk about the backsliding of democracy and how they are undermined in many. And then what do we need to do? We need maybe to go back to the basics. And what is the basic? The basics are the, the really the crucial essential elements of any democracy. 
free election, free affairs, freedom of expression, free media, vibrant civil society, separation of powers, uh, independent judiciary and courts. Because these, these I see, we cannot take this for given anymore. And who can address these issues? Then the Council of Europe. So I think it's, it's I think it's reflected somewhat in, in the reports uh, that I refer to. I also think another aspect is very, very important, and that is the execution of the judgment of the human aspect of the because that is really the essential element of the whole convention system that we have built up in Europe, which is unique. You don't find this type of protection anywhere in any company for this thing. That when these type of judgments are not implemented or are questioned, as I said, then we have a problem and the whole system is undermined. So we need also to do much more, I think, in terms of addressing this. Because we have, and Peter was chairing all this, uh, we have meetings in Stockholm among the ambassadors from the execution of them. They are four times every year. But what do we do in between these meetings? How can we continue a dialogue with the member states at the capital level? How can we put pressure? How can we make them implement the judgment and see that this is in their own interest? This is this. Then we need dialogue. We need also to offer expertise and assistance. So I think that we need much more focus on some of the systems. Because in the Council of Europe, we have the standard setting, it's very important. We have the monitoring, but we also have the assistance. These are the three pillars of our work. But we maybe have to focus even more on the system part in the year. Uh, maybe I've been too long, but I, I, uh, but I thought it was very important. Oh, that's excellent. It struck me in the, uh, in the report uh, by the Heidelberg Hale Group. Uh, it's a recommit that, you know, in, in the face of all the challenges that you've mentioned and which are set out in the report, Above all, what's called for is a recommitting by the heads of state and government to the basic, you said yourself, back to basics. But I don't, uh, I don't underestimate how difficult that might be in the changed circumstances. You've mentioned the growth of populist sentiment and, of course, um, uh, the, the difficulties with some member states, not only of the Council of Europe, but even of the European Union in relation to uh, well, independence of the judiciary we've mentioned. I'm not going to pursue that now. We might come back to it in the Q&A because we have a lot more to uh, to discuss. But I, our Icelandic colleagues, if uh, the happy event of having agreement on the summit uh, comes about, we'll have a huge amount of work to uh, to put in. So, um, Senator Lachlan, you're, you're leading the Irish delegation um, to the Parliamentary Assembly. Um, you're a vice chair of ALDI. And you've done your work, or you're doing your work as as rapporteur on a report. I think it was a report which was in process even before the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. It was on the question of a, a summit, but it's obviously been given the same added urgency as the, uh, the reflection process by, by that. So I'd just like to ask you, in, in, in a first, your assessment from the assembly point of view of the group's uh, recommendations, but perhaps you could also say something about the mood in the parliamentary assembly between delegations um, the uh, well the absence of the russian delegation which of course was um, already suspended as as bjorn has mentioned during our time my time there uh, because of the ukrainian takeover but um, and the, the the mood of delegations about holding the summit and what might come from that absolutely thank you peter and um, thank you for your warm welcome and firstly, I'd like to pay tribute to Radley and his team for the excellent leadership of the last six months. And of course, Minister Coburn and Minister Byrne. A lot of work has been achieved over a very difficult six months. And I think that the path has really been set in terms of why we need this summit and what we hope to achieve from it. And that was uh, really really essential in what we anticipate will be a positive decision next week. In terms of the high level reflection group, I think they've done excellent work and we can be very proud of Mary Robinson as chair of that. Within a relatively short period of time, 
they really highlighted so many of the areas that we need to recommit to because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to look back at basics and see how we can do them better, but also to see how we can reach out to the new generation and examine a new generation of human rights because the world has changed an awful lot and not just since February that, you know, when we look back over the last 20 years of societal change, some of it has been good, some of it not so good. And Bjorn has already touched on the democratic backsliding that we see, and that's incredibly worrying. We also on this was reflected within the group that as the Council of Europe, we need to be able to ensure that we have an early warning system in terms of uh, crises that can emerge, such as, you know, uh, the Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. And quite possibly one of the recommend, one of the 30 recommendations is around paying closer attention to monitoring, to election monitoring, and of course, to the regular monitoring uh, that goes on on an ongoing basis. But certainly I think that more attention can be paid to those. The, uh, I, I think where our emerging report, and obviously it's an ongoing work, we expect to have this stage of it completed by the 13th of December. We had a meeting last week with the Council of Ministers and with Congress, and both went very well, and there was very much support for the ideas that we have put in place. And of course, we've had ongoing meetings within PACE itself. We'll be having another one in about three weeks time in Iceland. So we're not at the point of completion because after 13th of December, we will have our plenary in January. And at that stage, we will have the, the completed document. But the areas that we're very close to with the high level reflection group uh, essentially are around the need for the Council of Europe to be seen as a very clear political community and the need to make that stronger, to have more political clout because we can do more and we should do more and the capacity is there, particularly when our member states and particularly the ones that are not within the European Union and hope to be, we can do so much work there within those particular countries. So that's something that we're both very clear on. The second area that we're very committed to is how we look at engaging our citizens. That's hugely important. And I don't think it's something that we do particularly well at the moment. Uh, we need to listen to our younger generation in particular. So looking at how we do that engagement, how we have the public consultation that we need on key issues of societal change, working out the mechanisms of those is a bigger challenge than saying that we want to do it. But it's very important that we say that that's one of the areas that we really, really want to concentrate on. Um, also, the Council of Europe can only be as good as the member states want it to be. And in terms of financially supporting the Council of Europe, it's important that more financial resources are put in place, particularly when we have a situation now where obviously we won't have the ongoing funding that Russia would have put in. Uh, so those three areas are hugely important, as well as ensuring that we are able to put a, a, a complex area, but trying to simplify it, that we can ensure that Russia is held accountable for its war of aggression. Because while there are those key areas that I mentioned that we need to look at, because of this particular juncture, and you're absolutely right, Peter, there was a lot of talk about the need for a fourth summit before this war started, but that has 
brought us to this particular crossroads. And we need to ensure that that is captured within the fourth summit. Um, the fourth summit, of course, cannot just be a photo call. It cannot just be a, um, a summit where we gather with our presidents and our heads of state and government and say, you know, this is a moment in time. We need to prepare for it very much. And that's why these, you know, both the reflection group, the consultations that we're having, the reflection period that PACE and the Committee of Ministers have been having since last June are hugely important. And the period afterwards in terms of the recommendations that have been put forward, will be put forward by PACE and by the, community, the Committee of Ministers, how we can have the right conclusions, but they need to be practical and pragmatic. While we want the summit to be ambitious and to have a renewed vision, at the same time, we have to ensure that there is pragmatism, pragmatism uh, there too, because there's no point in going in with a wish list this size and saying we want to completely change the world because then we're not going to be taken seriously. So it's the, the work is ongoing. In terms of the mood, obviously since February, the key topics in the Council of Europe and many of the debates have been about Russia and Ukraine. And obviously the Ukrainians have suffered hugely. Um, but all of Europe has been impacted, um, you know, in terms of energy, in terms of food, in terms of the people fleeing war from Ukraine and all of us trying to do our very best for them. So that has dominated very many of our discussions. We're absolutely unified in terms of our commitment to ensure that there will be a fourth summit that's meaningful. We're absolutely committed to supporting Ukraine, and we're equally committed to ensuring that Russia is held accountable for its crimes. In terms of other areas of debate, it was interesting, we had a debate in terms of Brexit and the human rights of the people in Northern Ireland being impacted by Brexit at our last plenary. It was really an excellent debate and uh, one worth watching if, if, if anybody is interested. Um, but it's I think it's fair to say too that because of the absence of Russia, there have been some positive developments in terms of relationships between different countries that are there, um, particularly Armenia and Azerbaijan. And uh, so, you know, we, we can take that as a good act. None of us would ever hope to be where we are at this point in time. But the mood has slightly changed uh, in terms of some of those dynamics, shall we say. But it's been an incredible uh, experience, from my point of view, to, to listen, to learn, to watch, to observe. So the uh, plenary and the completion of the, the work that you've been engaged in and its input to the uh, process. I take your point about not overloading a summit if, if there is agreement on a summit. I think that I'm sure John would agree that's going to be very important if the the output is to be a, a recommitment to the basic uh, values and principles. And, and, yeah. Two of the areas that I should say that from while we totally agree with the recommendations from the high level reflection group, two areas that from PACE we're very focused on, and I'm interested in hearing what Aoife has to say, is in relation to climate change and the right to live in a healthy environment and in dealing with artificial intelligence as well. There are two areas that we're very much focusing on, uh, along with gender-based violence. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Professor Nolan, you've studied and, and written very extensively on, uh, on human rights in Europe and on trends in the, the treatment of rights, both in Europe and more widely. Um, you have a very practical involvement yourself in the vindication of rights because you're a as we mentioned, the Vice President of the Committee on Social Rights, which oversees the implementation of the Charter, which is a parallel instrument to the, uh, to the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, well before the, the Russian 
aggression against Ukraine, there was concern, as we've been saying, about what is now termed democratic backsliding in parts of Europe um, and the intimate connection between democracy, human rights, and the rule of law is identified in the, uh, the report. The erosion of standards and respect in one of those areas contributes to a more general democratic decline, if we can call it that. Uh, so beyond the, the summit, um, as we said, there's 29 other recommendations. The report makes a series of wide ranging suggestions in relation to enhancing um, human rights protection and ensuring sustainable democracies. So based on your own research, your experience, your involvement in the, the Charter, how do you react to the report's presentation of the current human rights landscape in Europe? And what is needed to advance it? How can it be reconciled with uh, the issue of the sufficiency of resources, uh, which is referred to, thing. that states are prepared to invest in this part, in this uh, dimension of dealing with the problem? Well, I mean, I, I feel a bit of a, a copycat because all, I, my first comments will absolutely echo what's been said. I think it's an excellent report. I think the recommendations are pragmatic. I think they're very clear. I think they're valuable. And I was very pleased to see a reference to resources and budget in the report because there is no point turning around and saying we're hugely committed to rule of law, democracy and human rights. And then not being able, not being prepared to provide the resourcing necessary to, you know, to support the institutions and the activities that give effect to those values, because otherwise you're paying lip service, you're not actually showing genuine commitment. So for me, that was a very strong part of it. Um, I think for me, the report is fantastic, obviously. I mean, I know everyone would love me to go through each of the 29 recommendations in detail, right? Or 25 to six, this is what we all need. But no, so I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna flag a couple of things. So I think it's very valuable, but I was surprised in the report and a little bit disappointed while being conscious of the length and the many, many other, uh, the many, many things that, that were covered in it. I was surprised to see the limited focus on the really, at this point, very long standing socioeconomic and environmental challenges faced by Europe. And this isn't just because I'm a social rights fanatic, but you know, it isn't just that. I think, you know, realistically, there's a, the, the report quite rightly, its recommendations are focused on, you know, securing sustainable democracy and democratic inclusion. Okay. But we need to remember that sustainable and effective democracy isn't just about the right to vote or the right to protest or the right to freedom of assembly. And there is a, you know, there is plenty of research that makes a strong link between factors such as poverty, economic inequality, insecurity, depleted living standards, and populism, political extremism, and democratic backsliding, right? And so, and these factors are strongly linked with the effective enjoyment of social rights. Okay. So it's not just about civil and political rights. And if the Council of Europe is serious about sustainable democracy, its focus can't be exclusively or even predominantly on civil, on civil and political rights. And I think, and so I think when we're, th when we're conceptualizing how the Council of Europe and its different entities, both political and of course, human rights monitoring and et cetera, are thinking about promoting sustainable democracy, then I do think social rights and their protection has to be given adequate attention. I think that's challenging, not just in the context of the high level report, but in the context of a system where social rights really remain subordinated to civil and political rights. Okay, That is not for a second to denigrate the convention or the court. They are fundamental. However, human rights aren't just about civil and political rights. Democracy, effective democracy won't just be secured through the securing of civil and political rights. And I think that as we move forward from this crossroads, we need to bear that bear that in mind as we push it through. I mean, and 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 the thing is it's to some degree it's it's about, you know, I'm not saying we go out there. It's about the Council of Europe saying, oh, nation states, you should be doing state parties, you should be doing this, 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 and this. I mean at a fundamental level, it's wonderful to see in the report this reference to perhaps the EU ratifying the European Social Charter. But in practice, there's much more immediate steps that can be taken by Council of Europe and different entities. You know, there are only 40, only 42 out of the 46 states have signed up to the Social Charter as opposed to the European Convention. 
a far, far smaller number have signed up to the collective complaints mechanism. And that is within the Council of Europe itself. That's before we even get to the outreach, let the world know about the values we have. So, so I just want to flag, flag that element. Um, and I'm very conscious, you know, that this would have been, you know, that people are aware of this and we have um, Michael D. Higgins' superb speech, but I think it's something that's coming to the fore in discussions around future developments for the Council of Europe, the social rights angle. And I think it's fundamental and I, I want to piggyback a little bit uh, on what Fiona was saying about this key emphasis on, you know, youth involvement and inclusion of a youth perspective, which is a very strong element of the report. And that tied together with things like, you know, a legal instrument on democratic, you know, education and democracy and the idea of outreach to various groups. I mean, I think these are fundamental to making the Council of Europe, again, echoing you, Fiona, more relevant to young people. OK, and it's not just about people knowing what the Council of Europe does. It's about the Council of Europe actually actively advancing, acknowledging and advancing the issues that are important to young people and perhaps important that they accord a very different priority to than, say, than, than older people. And I mean, an obvious example of that is the issue of intergenerational equity, which is pretty much hardwired into many European societies following the financial and economic crises compounded by COVID-19, and now with the cost of living crisis. So if we're serious about the Council of Europe reflecting younger people's concerns, we have to bear in mind the particular challenges that younger people face relative to older people whose interests perhaps are better reflected in the work of the Council of Europe so far. Okay, so I, these are, I mean, they're just a series of thoughts, but that's to build on what I think are a set of enormously pragmatic and helpful recommendations. And I absolutely agree with Fiona that the summit, it mustn't become an aspirational wish list, you know, which it ends up being utopian and undermining itself. But I do think there's scope for imagination. I do think it's important. And I thought your report, the document, Fiona, sorry, from, from your committee that you authored, is hugely important in very clearly acknowledging the linkage or the imbrication between social rights, poverty, inequality, and democracy. And I do hope that as things develop around the summit, that that remains a key part of it. And of course, climate change is a fundamental element of that. Um, and it's not just a social rights issue, but I think it's not, I, I think it's frequently dealt with social rights in the same breath, and I don't think that's a coincidence. Achieve, but, um, well, you've raised a number of points that I think will probably arise further in, in discussion, but before that, I want, to, I want to ask a question of the panel, perhaps Bjorn initially. Uh, the European Union looms quite large um, in the report. I, I'm even surprised, perhaps, by the extent to which it... Uh, is referenced. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I suppose it's understandable given its size and the resources which it commands. Uh, and well, there's the overlap in membership. There are, there are now 26 members of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Council of Europe who are in the European Union. And of course, the European Union, uh, although it's not itself a member of the, the Council, is a very major um, contributor to um, project work through through an extra budgetary contribution that it, that it makes um, annually. Um, but uh, what, what are the practical um, consequences of getting the EU to accede to both the Convention on Human Rights and indeed to the Social Charter, um, which has been mentioned? And what is, what is the current state of play in relation to that? I have to say that those two <laughs> issues were around when I was there six or seven years ago. So I, I'd just be interested to hear, um, as I say, how important is it and where do they stand at, at present? And then uh, perhaps, it, and, and, and it's not only to yourself, but the role of the Council of Europe vis-a-vis -vis countries which aspire to become members of the European Union, but are in whatever we want to call it, the waiting room or the ante room uh, uh, for perhaps quite an extended period of time, given the political circumstances in Europe at the moment. You, yourself first. No, oh, I, uh, I think uh, these issues are very much still around. And, and uh, of course, there are some positive news now when it comes to the EU accession to the European Convention on Human Rights. Mm -hmm. 
The negotiations have been uh, restarted. Uh, they have come quite far now in reaching an agreement. Uh, there is only, as I see, I've heard from those who are involved in negotiations, it's very much now related to an internal issue on the EU side uh, related to the European uh, Common Foreign Policy. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are very uh, promising uh, and, and, and important uh, news, I think. And, and there was also this discussion in the past that the day the EU accedes to the European Convention, that's the, when we're going to have a new summit. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that in itself is so important that it warrants the summit. Uh, because then you will have one system for the protection of human rights, uh, rule of democracy in Europe, and not two parallel systems. Uh, so it's really crucial, and 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 the news are 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 good. Having said this, of course, um, the EU has has really become a very very important partner for the Council of Europe. Uh, they are very close uh, working relations with between the two organizations at at all levels, uh, the highest level with the commissioners because they come to Strasbourg, of course, once a week, uh, a week every month. Uh, uh, and there are discussions then, of course, with the Secretary General and the various commissioners. Of course, there's a focus on the aspiring countries to, to be wants to become member of the of the EU. You said also, of course, the EU is financing certainly a large degree of what we the project cooperation we are doing in 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 various member states up to sixty seventy percent now. So they are a crucial and important partner for us and. Um, um, I just wanted to say something also about youth and, 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 and also engaging the citizens. And this is really essential. Uh, there was a survey, I think, in the Netherlands a few years back. Uh, they asked young people born after the year 2000, how important is it to live in a democracy? One out of three found it important. One out of three. That's the Netherlands. I mean, I'm from Norway. Maybe we find the same survey there or in Ireland. I don't know. But if we lose the young people, and what sort of Europe will we have in 20, 30 years uh, if this is the attitude? But it's something to come. The issue is how do we connect to them? And then, as you also said, Professor Noel, we need to connect with, with them on issues that they care about, that they, you know, that affects them, that they are interested in. And we haven't been good enough in doing that, I think. Uh, I say that on the council, behalf of Council of Europe. Maybe it's the same with the EU. I don't know about the international institutions. So this is so important. And we also have spoken a long time ago, uh, or for several years, uh, about the lack of visibility of the Council of Europe. Mm -hmm. Because who knows about the Council of Europe? Uh, you do a survey out there uh, on the streets of uh, Dublin. They think it's the EU, or they've never heard about it, or maybe they've heard about the court. Uh, and this is the same in all European, all the 46 member states. So we have now come to the conclusion that this is something we need to really address, uh, the vis lack of visibility. And when I say that, it's not going to be that then we are going to tell the whole Europe how brilliant the Council of Europe is, how important we are, blah, blah. No, we need to connect to the citizens. Take up issues that they care about. It could be the climate change. I mean, the work we do now on human rights and the environment. And that is good that you have it in your report. It was not in the high-level reflection group report. And also artificial intelligence issue, but there are other issues you know, that that really young people are care about, and 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 uh, and ordinary people are care about. And what we need to do really is to have ordinary people telling their story, how the convention, how the uh, Istanbul Convention have saved lives, how the court judgments have really made a huge difference in their own personal lives. If you get these people. You know, to tell these stories, these testimonies, mm -hmm. then maybe there will be an understanding, a better knowledge that the Council of Europe is quite important, as a matter of fact, today. And if you look at that, the, the role of the organization over the last 70 years, it's, it's been quite remarkable. The harmonization of the legislation in all the European countries when it comes to the protection of human rights, democracy, and rule of law, because of the court judgment. And I, but ask people about it. They never heard about it. They have no understanding of it. So there are so many elements like this. And now we will deal with it. We, have, we are mobilizing 46 member states. Uh, and, and they have appointed contact persons in every member state. We will start working with them to see if we can define projects, also targeting youth, uh, various other people, ordinary citizens. So that's, that's really crucial. And uh, 
And I agree fully also what you said on the summit. It's not a, you know, a shopping list of uh, all good courses we want to see. This is what happened, as a matter of fact, at the last summit we had in 2005. It was a Christmas tree, they said, because everything was there. A beautiful tree. But we don't need that. I mean, we need now the more to focus on, on some of the burning issues. Uh, and this is what I hope can come out of the next summit. In, I mean, in those are very good points. And I think uh, before Ireland even joins the European Union, I think uh, that the, the uh, membership of the Council of Europe is one of the very few international outlets that the country had, even before we joined the United Nations. But to the extent that people knew about it, it was through court activity and, and cases brought uh, to the court. Um, and I imagine uh, that that has helped the visibility of the court in countries now Ireland doesn't have a very high number of applications to the court, but countries from the former Soviet bloc, Eastern Europe, do have a number of them. Of course, Russia itself has an enormous number of cases brought to the court. Um, but I, I imagine that helps uh, the visibility of the, uh, of the Council of Europe um, in those countries. Did you want to say something, Lisa? I wanted to come in very quickly because I think the court judgments are fundamental and I agree with you and I'm sure Bjorn and Fiona will come in on the point of how they raise the profile of the Council of Europe and indeed of human rights. But I think one of the challenges that the Council of Europe has is that, you know, I mean, there's a de democratic backsliding and there's human rights backlash. And there's, I mean, I'm based in the UK where I think we can agree there's a, a particularly high profile series of arguments around human rights protection and the role of Strasbourg, but more broadly you see this. And I think part of the Council of Europe's mission moving forward about entrenching, say, human rights, is to try to somehow make clear that these are not just reactive, you know, punishment beating, you know, beating sticks for states. They're, it's about, it's about, it's, it's about how do we get people to take ownership of them to, tr to, to ensure that, you know, the people they're voting for, or the people they're interested in, in terms of you know law or policymakers, use them as, as a proactive framework for law, policy, and resource allocation. Because I think if we're serious about achieving human rights, the court is these are, I mean, this is such an important role, highlighting violations, but actually we sort of want to get to the point where the court isn't needed. I mean, you know, that's completely utopian. There'll always be violations. But my point is I think a little bit about that. And I think this idea of, you know, in the report about further engagement with NHRIs and different institutions like that, that's fundamental when we're talking about putting human rights at the heart of political decision making, not simply as kind of, you know, post facto assessment and criticism tools about policy making. So, yeah, excellent point. But of course, beyond the court and the convention, somebody referred to other instruments which are equally, which were very important in current circumstances, the Istanbul Convention on gender-based violence, I think it is, or violence against women in particular. But there are other conventions that are, are having a real impact too. And they often have a crossover impact uh, with the European Union when it comes to develop a particular instrument in particular. The committee is ever more cited in national judgments and standard setting. So absolutely, that's part of the process. And I think it's to be welcomed. It's just... Um, Senator, do you, does the EU issue that I raised does it uh, does it figure in your own thinking in the um, well in the work you're doing on the summit, but even among members of the um, the assembly generally, the the preponderant weight that the EU has in European uh, cooperation in the broadest sense, and the 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 relative imbalance um, with the Council of Europe. Well, it's certainly an imbalance in terms of financial funding, <laughs> apart from anything else. But I think, um, as Bjorn says, you know, the partnership is really important and it's important that there is there's a synergy there. I do think that on a national level within member countries that there could be more synergy between, uh, for example, those that are members of the European Parliament, of PACE and of Congress. And that came up last week, where at Congress, it's councillors that um, attend their plenary, but it came up quite a bit that they felt quite disassociated from everything else that was going on. So I do think that at a national level, every country needs to take ownership and responsibility 
for that element. In terms of how the Council of Europe can support accession countries, and I thought it was interesting, not long after Ukraine applied for their membership, they signed up to the Insta Istanbul Convention. But the same week, the UK signed up. I was quite shocked that the UK hadn't signed up years before. I, I really was quite shocked, but I think a lot of the conventions that are in place with, and obviously, and you make the point, Eva, that not all member countries have signed up at all. But I think that that's, there's a system there of monitoring and trying to, um, for the European Union, if we do this correctly, that there is a system of um, ensuring that the applicant countries are adhering to a European set of values that we feel very strongly about. So I think that's important. Just one, another point that I'd make also when you were talking about um, the judgment cases, the, you know, that, that makes citizens of a country realise how important the Council of Europe is. And I couldn't think of a more striking area than David Norris's case, you know, in terms of homosexuality. And that really led the way in terms of Ireland becoming a world leader in relation to the human rights of those within the LGBT community. And, uh, and I think that's really important. So when we talk about the impact of court decisions, um, that's, that's just a striking example of one of them. Mm -hmm. And cases in relation to Northern Ireland, which you mentioned as well, of course, which are a huge, a huge- Newton case, of course. Um, uh, but time is moving on. I just want to ask, uh, before we move to questions, um, about Russia and uh, accountability was mentioned. Um, can you just, Bjorn, perhaps uh, uh, tell us what exactly is the situation with regard to uh, cases which Russian citizens had brought to the court and were in process, cases which may have um, come about as a result of the invasion, and, uh, and well, from you know here on, what 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 do you say to people who have uh, Ukrainians in particular? Who have complaints about uh, about Russian um, abuses? So uh, there are around eighteen thousand uh, remaining cases uh, in regard to Russia. Cases. They are on the books. They are now on the books huh? uh, because there was a period from the fifteenth, sixteenth of March until the sixteenth of September where they we're still accepting Russian uh, complaints uh, cases. And uh, the, the the latest figure I heard it was eighteen uh, outstanding cases. Uh, the president uh, of the court was in the committee of ministers quite recently, and and uh, they have tried to discuss it uh, how they should deal with this number of cases. And I think they will do a certain selections, if I understand him right, uh, and and focus on certain important cases, and and uh, and then. Um, they will take it from there, and and uh, so uh, I think this is uh, more or less what I, I can recall of, of what the court were going to do now, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, when it comes to these cases. So, uh, yeah. but it's, it's it's a dilemma, of course. You know, this this concern every case concerns an individual, so yeah. it's it's really a difficult issue for the court to deal with at the same time. At the same time, they also have the non-cooperation of the Russian Federation, okay. so. It's but how but we've yeah. lost through, through having Russia expelled. Obviously, it had to be expelled. But how much we have lost in terms of the uh, access of individual Russian citizens to the court? It was a very very huge step when it was yeah. when it was taken. Right. Let's see if we have some questions. Oh, we have a lot of questions in the room. Francis first. Francis Jacob. Francis Jacob. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting panel. I was, as a staff member of the European Parliament, I spent many, many uh, months of my life in, during plenary sessions as a tenant in your building. Um, two questions. One is a, a slightly wider one than Peter Gunning's question about Russia, and that is the um, Russia being expelled. What, what impact is there on the staff of the, of the Council? And the budget has been mentioned, but more importantly, 
What legacy did Russia leave? How active was it in the Council of Europe? I have no idea. I'd love to know about that. And my second question is a complicating factor for the visibility of the Council of Europe's work, and that is the development of the European political community. And having its first meeting, having its second meeting now planned in Moldova, and isn't that going to further complicate the task of differentiating the work of the Council of Europe from that of the European Union? Oh, thank you very much, Francis, for your for your question. Uh, when it comes to uh, Russia uh, and uh, the uh, ex uh, expelling Russia from the from the organization after being a member for twenty six years, and the relations uh, to the staff, um, we can only have staff members that uh, are citizens of one of our member states. So that's quite clear. Um, and there were uh, 58 uh, Russian staff members with a, only a Russian passport. I think 51 of them will leave. Uh, there were also a number of Russians who had dual nationalities. They could be French Russian or Italian Russian. Of course, they are now can say, no, I am French. Uh, France is a member. Italy is a member. So, so there, there will not be a, a direct consequence uh, as a staff member. Having said this, of course, the, we are all, it's not that we are agents of the countries we are from. Uh, we are international civil servants, and we take the oath well, that you know we, we 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 don't belong to any nationality, so to say. I mean, uh, when we work in the in the Council of Europe uh, as such. But having said that, there's such a, there's of course a high degree of sensitivity with what happened, and 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 uh, and, and uh, also quite a lot of pressure, and and. Uh, because it's difficult also being a Russian, for example, a staff member and going on a mission to Ukraine or to another member state uh, under the circumstances we are in now. So there are many aspects to this, but there was also a number of legal uh, advice taken in the whole to prepare the process and, and to, to take the appropriate decisions, which the Secretary General did. And, 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 and so, uh, but it's it's still uh, it's it's a sensitive issue, particularly for Ukraine, I think, but also for many other countries. This issue with the Russian staff and, and, and so on. So, but this is at least the update on that. On the budget, it was a very important decision taken quite quite early after the expulsion of Russia, and that was an agreement that now is not the moment to weaken the Council of Europe. Uh, now, the forty six remaining countries would, in a way, bridge the gap. In the budget, and Russia was a grand payeur. Uh, they paid uh, 11, 12 percent of the budget. So now the forty-six member states, as I said, who are members now, we will fill that hole. So uh, that was a very important decision and, and a very important political one too, I think, uh, for the organization. So um, they were active in a number. I mean. They, they did quite a, a, a good job in terms of follow up the execution of judgments, for example. I mean, a vast number of judgments were actively followed up by the Russian Federation and so on. There were some problematic ones, of course, also. Uh, they had the tendency to focus on uh, social rights, uh, cultural issue, education, um, sports, these type of issues. They were... But there are, or there are also other member states who are very active, actively promoting these issues too. So we're not at, at all alone in this. So I don't know if it's fair to say if they leave any legacy at all, but uh, they were 26 years a member in the organization and they were quite an active member in a number of areas. And, um, so um, quite constructive. And, uh, I recall young Russian lawyers seconded to the uh, courts um, section dealing with the implementation of the judgments and a very valuable interaction between them and the, the court institution. Of course, all of that is, was gone when the, uh, even before the invasion and the suspension of, of the, the Crimean uh, takeover was implemented. Is anything further to add? Yeah, from yeah, the point Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, particularly in relation to the European political community and that, uh, to a certain extent, is the elephant in the room, shall we say. And um, I think, you know, in June, 
particularly when I was tasked with preparing this report and having the stakeholder engagement within, et cetera. We were concerned uh, about the European, the, the, the notion, because at that stage it hadn't happened, the European political community. Um, I do acknowledge certainly that it is focusing on areas of energy and security. But I would also say that in terms of security, the greatest security is democratic security. And the this is where the Council of Europe comes in. We have a very strong 73 year history. And it has been mentioned earlier about, you know, court decisions that have been made, conventions that have been put in place. And when you consider the, the membership and the the huge work that has gone into countries working together, and I really have to compliment the staff too, Bjorn. They're, they're absolutely exceptional, you know, particularly the ones that I have been working with in, in PACE. Um, to say that we need a new political community uh, and to ignore what's there is slightly concerning. There, while there has been an agreement that there will be the next meeting in Moldova and the timing of that seemed to be around the timing that we had hoped that there would be the fourth summit. Uh, and then there was the talk that maybe the two would meet back to back. Uh, that would be completely wrong in my view because that would lead to greater confusion about the role of the Council of Europe and about the very strong mandate that it has from its member states. So I suppose, you know, the message that I would say going from here is that um, let us work together, let the political community come to the summit and, uh, and contribute. But I think that we really have to own this space. And because of the confusion that is out there and because of the potential threat that it is, I, I think that in itself really asserts the need for that fourth summit. So that's my view. The, uh, the Secretary General to Paris and the President Macron might help to uh, remove some of the ambiguities that you're, you're talking about, Aoife. I think those hazards affect capacity, but we're a 15 person committee. We sit seven weeks a year. We divide a very heavy workload and we're all part time and we're not paid between 15 people. And when Russia was expelled, it wasn't clear whether our Russian committee member would in fact, in fact, it became clear legally it was unlikely that they would automatically leave the committee. They did ultimately resign. But so since May, we've been doing the work of 15 people, which was already too much for 15 people with 14 people. And thankfully we will have an election. Uh, well, now it looks like they won't be replaced until, until January due to the nomination process. But that's a very direct example of where an expert human rights monitoring body was directly affected by, by the move of Russia away from the Council of Europe. What about the questions here, this lady? Valerie Hughes, yeah. And I was formerly Ireland Action for Bosnia, um, and now I'm with Syria Community. But it, it's a direct uh, question about Bosnia and the Council of Europe from the Democratization Policy Council in Bosnia. My friend, Kurt Basiner, who has been over here several times to talk about Bosnia with members of the community. Um, just would the Council of Europe care to comment on the impact on equality of the franchise and civil rights of the international high representative imposition of changes to Bosnia's election law and feder federation constitution on October the 2nd election night. Five European court human rights rulings, um, Seji Finci up to Puderets has not been implemented. Finally, does the Council of Europe accept the high representative's um, contention that he cannot amend the state constitution as per European Court of Human Rights rulings. And just finally, um, it was just Key Kean Fitzgerald, who's a, a member of the Institute, he asked a very interesting question about refugees in because Falsha was one of the three pillars of the Irish presidency of the Committee of um, the Council of Ministers. 
And um, it was just about Minister Coveney said that he would like us to reflect on the contrast between the huge solidarity shown to Ukrainians vis-a-vis -vis the lack of solidarity for Syrians and other people. And it's just in view of six members of the Council of Europe and then Turkey is deporting Syrian refugees. But there is um, six members of the Council of Europe, Cyprus, Italy, Greece, Hungary, Austria, Poland, they're advocating re-engagement with the Assad regime. And the whole idea that the non-refoulement principle of international law is now being breached, it's so shocking because I know myself, Syrian refugees here who have family members who are drowning and the impact, the traumatic impact on these people who are living in Ireland in our midst is just unbelievable. And there's no media coverage. There's no coverage of their plight whatsoever, but they're so traumatized. And thank you very much. Severity and, and human impact of what you're talking about. But with Syria, we're straying a long way away from the Council of Europe. I, I take the point of the comparison that you make. You've asked a very detailed question about Bosnia. I, I don't know if anyone, frankly, on the panel is in a position to, to comment. I, 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 it, of course, we have an office in Bosnia. We have a long-standing project cooperation with the Bosnian Herzegovina. You mentioned the Seji Finji judgment has been a really an issue that has been raised over and over again by the Council of Europe. The need to have it implemented and executed. So, uh, yeah. So I think maybe I would. Yeah. Yeah. So here, yeah. Uh, sorry, just a quick question. Andrew Ford is my name. Um, uh, the, the Council of Europe acted with with kind of, you, you could nearly say, uncharacteristic decisiveness uh, this year. Uh, <laughs> and I say that as a formal, uh, as a former staff member, with the, with with all due respect. But but it was excellent. It really has been excellent to see what's happened this year. But one of the points of decisiveness was um, that the Council of Europe committed, both the Parliamentary Assembly, the Committee of Ministers have both said that it's really important now to engage with democratic forces in Belarus and the Russian Federation. But the question I'd have is how is that going to really look in practical terms? I'm not mistaken from the, uh, from the Robinson or the High Level Committee. Yeah, well, uh, when it comes to uh, the Belarusian civil society, uh, we are we have had quite close contacts over quite some time now. She was even invited to the committee of minister Tikhanovskaya uh, as the main representative of the opposition in the country, now in exile. Um, we have also uh, established now a contact group between the Council of Europe and the various parts of the opposition in Belarus uh, to facilitate, so to say, uh, a closer dialogue and, and cooperation. And this is just a few weeks ago, in September, I think, we, we established this uh, contact group. Uh, so it's, it's a, a very new initiative. So there, we are trying to reach out to support uh, the Belarusian uh, civil society, the independent one, uh, the opposition uh, in exile. Uh, we also had, there was also a very good event in the parliamentary assembly on how we can help better political prisoners in Belarus. And that, uh, I participated also in this discussion. And, and that is also a, a very important uh, aspect to this because, um, and then um, uh, for the Russian civil society, um, we will see, I mean, we don't have, come that far. I think there are certain institutions that are independent in, in many ways and, and organizations as well, and how we can support them. We will see everything is so tense now mm -hmm. and, and, and complicated for the moment. So, so maybe we need a little more time to see how we can also support these more democratic groups and, and forces in the country. I don't know. There was another question at the back, Colin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin Rafter, retired foreign affairs, and uh, by no means an expert at the Council of Europe. I want to, first of all, congratulate everybody involved in the presidency of the Council of Europe. It's been absolutely fantastic, and uh, congratulations all around for the great success. Taking everything that the panel has said uh, without further uh, elucidation on my part, just want to mention the, the, the leadership that Ethan Owen has shown over the years in the area of social and economic rights. I want to thank her for that. Question. And I know this has been mentioned already, the, the, the political community. 
we're in a situation where the multilateral landscape in Europe is changing. The Brits have left uh, the EU. The Swedes and the Finns have joined NATO. Um, the OSCE is arguably um, much uh, weakened because of the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. And taking everything that has been said in terms of the report headed by <coughs> President Robinson uh, as, as being correct, I was slightly disappointed in that it didn't provide for a more dynamic perspective on how the role of the Council of Europe might evolve in this changing landscape. In other words, recommittal is fine. Everything that's said, been said about human rights is absolutely correct. But is there, a new, is there a prospect, is there a possibility that the Council of Europe could have a more dynamic role in the European architecture? It was a real pity that the Prague summit was held without any reference to the Council of Europe. Arguably, I think it should have been the Council of Europe summit, but that's, that moment has passed. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, well, that's reopening questions. <laughs> yeah, Sandra Larkin. Um, thanks, Colin, for your question. And uh, I completely agree with your analysis. And in terms of the road ahead, uh, yes, absolutely. That, you know, while the Council of Europe obviously has um, its, you know, commitments in the area of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, and has the leg legal expertise to draft uh, conventions, etc. Um, I think there is a lot more potential that uh, the Council of Europe can take on. And I think that has to be a key piece of the summit. And I think that that has to be form part of the recommendations that we will be making in terms of our final report from PACE. And I would expect the Council of Ministers during their present reflection period uh, to take that on board. And certainly in relation to the two engagements that I have had with them at this stage, that thinking was very much part of it in terms of how we support and, and while obviously reaffirm and reconfirm, it's how we expand the role. So that, that is very much part and it's trying to find that mechanism um, and, and that's key between now and when the summit will happen. Are there anything, John? Yeah. Okay. So was there one other question from the room that I think I saw? Yes. I'm gentle to the one that Aidan Kieran is my name. Among other things, I'm former deputy parent rep to the council. Sorry, I didn't I thought I could be heard here. Um when it was based in Dublin, actually. But um uh, I'm interested to see how bringing it back to the, the specific question of, of the future of the council, how uh, the panel or any member of the panel would see the cooperation with the other institutions uh, in this uh, architecture. I'm thinking specifically of the OSCE as the one I'm most familiar with. And the senator mentioned election monitoring, which of course is already done uh, by the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. But I'm wondering if any thought has been given to how the role of the council can be expanded without cooperating with other organizations but avoiding duplication. And I'm wondering if any thought has been given to that. By the way, just as a footnote, uh, Mr. Bergen mentioned earlier on about, uh, if you like, selling the council to young people. I'm pretty sure that most young people do not know, even though it's in the title, that the Council of Europe framework of reference for languages is actually devised. Indeed. And when they see A1 to B2, Indeed. whatever. It's a good point. A, 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 an Irish official played a part, big part of the mm -hmm. yeah. No, a good point. Um, well, when it comes to the summit, you mentioned the summit uh, uh, also here, uh, but the cooperation with other international organizations, I think we, are, we will make a, a point out of it that we need to invite the other international institutions to actively take part in the summit. EU, OSCE, you mentioned the UN. Uh, just to ensure also this type of, uh, or avoiding this type of duplication to a largest possible degree and, 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 and also to ensure the closest possible cooperation. With the OSCE, I already discussed, the, we discussed the EU, I think, so I will not go into that. With the OSCE, um, it has not been that 
easy to establish uh, close relations and a, and a concrete cooperation in, in at various levels with the OEC, as a matter of fact. We have tried it over the years. For instance, one of the strengths of the OEC is its field operations, huh? the missions. Why can't we not work together in the field? Maybe share even office space or, or exchange experts. We have proposed things like this, but we have not been... Uh, it has not been uh, uh, possible to find an agreement with the OEC on this. I, you can even go further, I think. We can also exchange on the headquarter basis, uh, work more closely together also in certain aspects of the certain monitoring mechanisms we have that certain, is there certainly we overlap with what the OEC do. But this type of cooperation has been complicated to, to, to bring to fruit or, or to... to develop further for different reasons, I think. There's, they have a different composition in terms of membership, for example, in the OSC than we do. And, uh, but we have tried over the years, uh, but uh, it's been difficult. Professor Nolan, the, the UN, I don't know you have a role in relation to yeah, some of its yeah. bodies. Uh, I think that's a, a really, I think that's a really good question. It's a slightly different perspective, I'm bringing from the perspective of human rights monitoring body as opposed to, you know, a, another kind of entity within the Council of Europe. And I, when I saw the, the recommendation around cooperation with the UN, first of all, to some degree, we're, we're doing this, but it is work that should absolutely be further developed. I mean, the work, the human rights work, at the international level and the regional level are mutually reinforcing, particularly, I mean, example of social rights, but it's true across the board. And I think there's great opportunities to develop, to develop that work. However, that kind of cooperation from the perspective of human rights monitoring bodies requires, you know, staffing and capacity and resourcing. So I think it isn't simply a case of saying that's a nice thing. It's about thinking very concretely within the Council of Europe, how in fact you can develop those institutional relationships and forgive me for saying it again, resource slash staff them in a way that renders them meaningful as opposed to you know a random exchange of views every three years where you say hello and then move on without actually actively integrating the work you're doing or you know collaborating beyond that. But in your context, it must be clear that uh, Europe, through the Council of Europe, has a, a very advanced, if not the most advanced, uh, global system globally um, of a collective approach I, to I, the preservation I think, of human rights. I think we have a very strong system. I think we need to be very careful about being self-congratulatory. And I'm going to highlight no, one there. So, sorry, but I meant as a, an exemplar yeah. for, for, for others. Uh, and so my point is, if we look at, for instance, an area, and absolutely, this is a fantastic achievement. But if we say, look, that doesn't mean there isn't room for learning from others and that others aren't exemplars for us too. And a key example for that is the area of the right to a healthy environment. We are the only regional system that does not have legal direct protection of that, right? In terms of, sorry, either through the, for instance, the inter-American system, you have a very significant court judgment. In the African system, you have it in the context of the charter. At the UN system, you have this general assembly resolution and you know it's being embedded in various different ways. We don't have that in the Council of Europe. So that's an area in which actually collaboration is where we are on the receiving end, the learning end, rather than simply other people absorbing our efforts, if that makes sense. And I think that's important because I think we need to acknowledge where we can learn from others and develop our own work, whether learning from others or in tandem with others. I think we will wrap it up there. Um, I want to say a very big thank you to um, our three panel members, to Bjorn, to, um, to Aoife, and to Senator Lachlan. Um, I want to join in the congratulations to the Irish team that has had such a, a successful um, tenure in the, the chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers. But it's not over until it's over, so you have, <laughs> you have I think, five days left. And we well no, but we no, but you you have been very generous in your anticipation of what the uh, final meeting next week, which will involve Minister Kovney and his Icelandic counterpart, because he's the one who he or she well, is the one that will be taking over. Uh, so you've given us a very uh, a, a good preview of what will be agreed at uh, at that session. I hope that it will uh, conform to to everything we've discussed here today, namely the the convening of a a fourth uh, summit of the um, uh, of the Council of Europe, uh, and uh, well, the elements that uh, might, the parameters that might uh, surround such a meeting, we've I think teased out uh, here today. If anything, we've uh, we've come to certain broad orientations, but uh, it's clear that there are many 
complex uh, dimensions as well to be to be worked on, but no doubt over the next uh, with the input from the parliamentary assembly and lots of work between the Irish and Icelandic chairmanship, uh, the the um, the, uh, the summit and its documents or its outcome will will become clearer. So thank you all very much, um, and we'll um, we'll see how it turns out. Perhaps after the summit, time for another meeting here on the Council of Europe. Thank you all.